So Michael Cohen, he's not on the stand today because they're off on Wednesdays, but he's going to be back on the stand tomorrow, Thursday, and cross-examination will resume. It began yesterday with a bang. Um, the defense attorney got up there. Uh, hold on a second. Where is it? Do I have it around here? Okay, he, he, start, he started, Todd Blanche, by saying, uh, hi, I'm Todd Blanche. Uh, Mr. Cohen, my name's Todd, Todd Blanche, and you, you and I have never met. You went on TikTok and called me a crying little shit. <laughs> Cohen, sounds like something I would say. <laughs> the prosecutors objected and the judge sustained it. I don't know why that was sustained. Then even his co-counsel, Susan Necklace, couldn't help but smile, according to the Times. By the way, the New York Times writes this up. The, the you know ever fragile New York Times didn't want to write crying little shit. So they said they... He suggested Michael Cohen had called him a small and weeping piece of feces. <laughs> okay. Then he goes on to say, you referred to Donald Trump as a dictator douchebag. Cohen, sounds like something I said. Blanche, you said he should go back to, quote, uh, or go back where he belongs in a fucking cage, like a fucking animal. You recall saying that? I recall saying that. Uh, he asks him, is this trial personally important to you, Mr. Cohen? And Cohen says, personally, yes, it is. Uh, let's see, he gets into the obsession with Trump. You do four podcasts a week. And he's mentioned in every one, isn't he? Yes, I would say he, Trump, is mentioned in every single one. Um, by the way, the New York Times points out at least one juror said on voir dire that they listen to at least one of Cohen's four different podcasts as well. Cohen admits he's made roughly 3.4 million in sales of his two books over the past four years, both of which were about Trump. And then of course, do you want President Trump to get convicted in this case? Sure. Uh, Blanche shows him an enlarged photo of a coffee mug that sold on his site, Cohen's, which reads, send him to the big house, not the White House. Shows a shirt he sells that says convict 45. Shows a shirt he sells of Trump behind bars and wearing an orange jumpsuit. So what do you make of those highlights, Marsha, as a prosecutor yourself? If you were sitting there watching that cross of your witness, how would it make you feel? Um, I would hope that I would be completely unfazed because could you not see this coming a mile away or even like 50,000 miles away? Obviously, this is a very flawed witness. And when you put somebody I like this on the stand, and I would hope that she did, um, prepare the jury. It, I would do it in an opening statement even and say, look, this guy is a tough one. You know, he's tough to believe. Were you lying then? Were you lying now? He's got all kinds of bias. Nevertheless, we believe he's telling the truth because, and then you could talk about all the reasons you, all the ways you've corroborated his testimony. Um, but you should be completely unsurprised by all of this exchange, as crazy as it is, and as wildly ad hominem as these attacks are. I mean, that is the, the whole tenor of this thing, especially with Cohen on the stand. So um, I would think that she would have a very, um, she should be looking very calm um, and very relaxed. Like I saw this coming and I knew this was going to happen. And this is what I told the jury is what they were going to do. Mark, your thoughts? You know, I've often um, wondered why anybody thinks that Michael Cohen was going to make any difference in this case. I know that the prosecution has to put him on or arguably has to put him on. But I would venture to say that there's not a single juror who's going to come out of these deliberations and say to anybody, if they're being honest, you know what? I was going to acquit Donald Trump, but then I heard Michael Cohen and he changed my mind. Or I was going to convict Donald Trump, but then I heard Michael Cohen and now I'm going to acquit. It, the, to my mind, he's already baked into this. And frankly, I don't want I know I've been very cynical during this program, but this case was over in jury selection. The, yes. I tried these cases. I mean, my career was made on trying Susan McDougal down in Little Rock on contempt and obstruction of justice, which was a politicized case back before we'd even, you know, back, it's almost quaint by comparison, but the idea that somehow you're going to turn this, these jurors around, either by Michael Cohen or in your closing arguments, I hate to be the cynic here, but it's not gonna happen. I mean, these jurors' minds were made up when they were selected. 
I think that's probably true. I mean, um, but yeah, go ahead, Marsha. Yeah, you I mean, know, you know a thing or two about about the, you know the jury pool and the ultimate <laughs> jury being selected, having their minds made yeah. up. Yeah, it's true. And and by the way, it's kind of an axiom of trial law that your case is won or lost in jury selection. And I think that um, I, I could say an awful lot about the ways in which we uh, things went very wrong in the uh, rules that were imposed during the Simpson uh, voir dire. That said, um, Mark is right. It, it, it probably was decided when they selected the jury. That said, even if it wasn't, I also agree with Mark that Michael Cohen is not going to be the deciding factor either way. And I think that there were court watchers even saying that during his testimony, they were the jurors were looking very unimpressed, yawning, looking around, et cetera. That's By right. way of contrast, when Stormy Daniels was testifying, they were riveted. Um, well. There was an, an air of tension. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, a completely opposite. I wouldn't have thought that, but that's what they human. were describing. You know, there's an interesting, I don't, you know, not having been in the courtroom, I wish this was televised, but I will tell you, at least from the reporting and reading some of the excerpts of the transcripts, Stormy seemed to uh, bring some game or bring her A game. I mean, she seemed to, you know, I love Susan Nicholas. I think she's one of the best uh, criminal defense lawyers in Manhattan. Um, but she, uh, Stormy gave as good as she got. And I think that that's, jurors like pop. They like that back and forth, whether they say it or not or admit it or not. They're interested in that. I mean, they're sitting there. They're kind of a captive audience. They don't want to be bored to death. And and somebody like Stormy is colorful. And uh, it's quite a show. Well, to Mark, to OK, she brought her A game in terms of entertaining. That's literally her job. And but she, all that BS about newly Me Too remembrances, after all the previous Wait. statements, I never felt threatened, never felt threatened. He was my bitch. And now suddenly it's like, uh, she's, you know, Ashley Judd on the couch with Harvey. Please. And I, Megan, I don't disagree with you. As soon as I saw power imbalance, I wanted to gag because <laughs> if you watched if you watched her interviews like I did back in 2018, the idea, in fact, Bill Maher, to his credit, replayed one of those interviews recently within the last week. There and were you many. Watched, yeah, I mean, right. He wasn't the only one. So it was rehearsed. It was contrived. But it was still entertaining. Yes, she had their attention, that's for sure. And you're right, Marsha, I read the same reports that this jury's bored with Michael Cohen, which tells you what? I think that, to me, it, it tells me that they got exactly what they expected from him. And I, you know, I don't, I don't remember what they were saying in opening statements. It may be that they were, that they, the prosecutors really did pave that road for the jury to say, um, they did. this guy's going to get caught in a thousand lies, so be prepared. And I hope they did do that, because he should. Um, in which case he got up and he did exactly that. I, this is somebody who's a very, very difficult witness to lean on. Uh, they, I understand why they felt they had to call him. They did. He was in the middle of it all. But, um, but, but he's problematic. And as I understand it, uh, the feds did not want to bring charges because they knew he was going to be a necessary witness and they didn't like what they saw. So uh, he's problematic no matter how you look at it. Bias all over the place, lied here and lied there. I mean, it's very difficult to uh, walk a, a straight line with a guy like this, unless you have a lot of corroborating evidence, which I'm going to assume giving the prosecution the benefit of the doubt that they do. So, you know, I just think the jury's like, yeah, okay, we knew who you are and here you are. Let me tell you a story about a guy named Leo Grillo. Leo was on a road trip and came across a Doberman. This dog was severely underweight and clearly in trouble. Leo rescued the dog and named him Delta. Well, sadly, Delta was just one of many animals that needed help. And this inspired Leo to start Delta Rescue, the largest no-kill, care-for-life animal sanctuary in the world. They've rescued thousands of dogs, cats, and horses from the wilderness, and they provide their animals with shelter, love, safety, a home. April marked 45 years since Leo rescued Delta. Delta Rescue relies solely on contributions, and if you want caring for these animals to be part of your legacy— Go ahead and speak with your estate planner because there are tax benefits too. You can grow your estate while letting your love for animals live well into the future. Check out the estate planning tab on their website to learn more and speak with your advisor. We call dog a man's best friend for a reason. You can help those who need it most. 
Visit DeltaRescue.org today to learn more. DeltaRescue.org. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.